Welcome to a brand new week, a brand new day. IB Nation Sports Talk. We're up, we're rolling. He's Jesse Styers. I'm Sean Styers. If you can see us, I guess you didn't stare too close to the sun this afternoon. The <laughs> eclipse has come and gone. What, what did uh, Jesse, you were right in the line of fire in Cleveland. So you got like the full, did you get full darkness? There in Cleveland today? <clears throat> yeah, we did get full darkness. It was about 315 to 320. Um, and it was pretty cool. It got like um it, it went from like night or sorry, day to night. Temperatures dropped like 10 degrees. It felt it was really weird. It was like eerie, you know, like it and then you could feel it getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer uh-huh. and dimmer. And then finally it was, you know, completely dark and like I said, cold, and then the sun just came back. But it was really cool to see. I, I didn't know what to expect, um, but when it happened, it was just like this ring in the sky, and you could see um, my friends and I could see like Jupiter um, and Venus, and then there was like this red dot on the bottom of the moon too. I'm still trying to figure out what that was. But it was a lot of cool. It was. I'm sorry, a lot of fun. On top of the moon. Okay, interesting. Interesting. DK says he got some nice picks. Jesse sent me some good picks that he had from it. I'll be curious to see if. One Vince D'Addario has some good picks because Vince and the traveling D'Addarios all packed their bags yesterday and drove south to Muncie, Indiana. If you're not familiar with Muncie, it's a little bit northeast of Indianapolis, but it it was uh, along with Indianapolis right in the line of travel. So they spent the night in a hotel and I don't know what the hell you do in Muncie all day as you wait for that 15 minutes of darkness, but... <laughs> They did it. I mean, they've got the kids, you know, they've got all the young kids. So, you know, everyone was using it as an excuse to stay out of school and do the different stuff today. So I guess if you can go a couple hours and do it, you do it. Uh, My brother-in-law, your uncle and his wife and your cousin packed up and drove like two hours to go. Nice place and see it. So, yeah. Yeah. It was cool. It was, um, it was, I think, a little bit more built up. There was, there were people out. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think there was as many people as I thought there was going to be. But there yeah, were they police were that had like streets blocked off everywhere. At one point, you couldn't get to like the parks and stuff around us. They had it all kind of blocked. I was off. kind of envisioning like if you've seen the movie Independence Day, where the where the idiots in New York City and L.A. were out, you know, like partying with the ships coming overhead, and they're all, you know, they've got their signs, and everyone's, you know, out in the streets, and then everything goes berserk, obviously. But that's that's kind of how I was envisioning, you know, the way people were talking that that they'd be out partying in the streets and stuff like that. But yeah, you're right, John. I bet you can get eclipse glasses very cheap <laughs> right now. All you needed was was uh, like regular sunglasses with the uh, what do you call it? Like the extra polarized. Polarized. There you go. Polarized sunglasses. That's all you needed. You didn't have to get the you know like the uh, 3D looking special glasses. Tommy's asking if we saw the South Carolina post game presser. I didn't see the presser. I saw her on the court with, uh, you know, what she was talking about, Caitlin Clark. We'll talk about that a little bit later in Rapid Fire. Big national championship game. Just saw the uh, the viewership number. It is massive. It's another record. Basically, three of the last four women's basketball games set records. Three or maybe it was three of the last five, whatever. But the last three that Caitlin Clark was in, anyway, set viewership records for women's basketball, which is amazing but we'll talk about that later in rapid fire jesse and i both a little uh kind of eh today in terms of you know, i think like, it finally we had friends in all weekend and we, yeah. we, we were taking well, you, them out and they finally you've got, left. Your, you've got your eclipse party favor still hanging yeah. in the background so we had an eclipse party over the weekend yeah, i bet so you did i bet you did we Last were just um tired yeah i'm sure All right, well, we got the chance to uh, talk to two of Notre Dame's coordinators, both the offensive coordinator, Mike Denbrock, as well as defensive coordinator, Al Golden, Saturday over at the Irish Athletic Center at Notre Dame. We'll hear from Al Golden a little bit later in rapid fire, but we're going to start with some comments from Mr. Denbrock 
And considering the time on the field that Riley Leonard has missed over the past couple of weeks, I asked Mike Denbrock if Leonard has been able to absorb what he needs to absorb of the offense. No, I mean, it's, it's hard to judge – how much is really being retained? Right. Right. Is he learn? Is he a good learner? He's a great learner. Is he understand football? Absolutely understands football. Understands adjustments on the board. You get him on the board. He's great. Right. You watch film with him. He's great. He's got really good answers. You get out here and the bullets are flying for real. I don't know. You know what I mean? Till we see it. You know what I mean? Where he's actually at with his learning of and adjusting and being able to adjust what we're doing. So that'll come with time. So that's Mike Denbrock talking about Riley Leonard. What's he been able to absorb over the past couple of weeks with that ankle injury that he's got? He has been back out there on the field this week, kind of doing some light duty and throwing and stuff like that. But So you hear that, Jess? Does it give you any pause at all in terms of if you think that, that Riley Leonard is ultimately going to be Notre Dame's starting quarterback? No, I don't think it gives me any pause. I would have liked some more optimism there, but I mean, essentially, all he's saying is, <laughs> and that's kind of, I guess, why I asked it. Like that, yeah, you know? I mean, I guess it, it, he's not saying anything. I guess that we didn't already know or anticipate or expect. Like saying a guy, a guy is good on the board, just means that, like, you know, that in in video session, you'll go up to the whiteboard and kind of diagram and go through plays and stuff. So, like, what he's saying is conceptually, yeah. He knows what's going on. And then in film, he's able to kind of see some things and give good responses based off of probably, you know, pre-snap, post-snap, what he's seeing and stuff like that. But you're not going to ultimately know until the passes start flying. He's got to make the changes on the go, um, et cetera. It's like studying for the exam versus actually taking the exam, I think is probably the best way to put it. So I don't have any reserves. I mean, it's just a matter of can the, the, the ankle – stay healthy enough for him to perform out there. And I think as long as that, as long as the ankle is healthy, I, I do believe he'll be the starter and he, he'll have, you know, he'll, he'll be able to function and do everything that he needs to in the offense. No, I completely agree. This is a veteran quarterback with, you know, one full season, parts of two other seasons. I was going to say three years, but he's basically, you know, he's been around the block. He hasn't been around the block as much as Sam Hartman, but he's been out there. I think, as you just said, when the bullets are flying and He's read defenses before when it's live. He's called plays when it's live. You know, he's done all that stuff live before. So just because it's not there right now in the spring, I've got I've got no reason to believe that that he's not going to be the guy either. I mean, like it, it all comes down to health, I think. Just like you said, it, it comes down to is that ankle healthy or not? And Again, that to me is why, like, even if Riley Leonard feels like he can be out there in an ankle brace doing whatever, and I think we kind of disagreed a little bit about this last week, like, I'm not that excited about having him out there in the spring when he can basically just be doing all the mental reps and, and whatever else, getting as healthy as possible, and then use the summer to catch up on what he needs to catch up on, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So I don't know, like, is there any real benefit, do you think, when he's not out there? You know, he's not wearing full pads. He's not, you know, again, he's throwing some pass routes. What exactly, maybe we'll get a bigger, you know, picture this Saturday when we get to see a full practice exactly what he's he's doing. But at least the last couple of practices, he's been throwing and stuff, but he hasn't been running the full the full Monty. Yeah, I we briefly <clears throat> touched on this last week. I think that it's all visuals on Notre Dame's part of let's not hit the panic button. Hey, our quarterback is still out here. While he's not doing full participation, he still is throwing the ball, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's just trying to downplay the second procedure and just kind of show everyone that it's not as big of a deal as, as people might believe but that's just my opinion i and i like that I, i'd rather be proactive and see a guy out there in some capacity than no capacity i think the bigger question for this would you want what, what would you if it came down to it and he wasn't fully recovered would you take a 75 percent riley leonard or 100 percent steven jelly 75 percent riley leonard it's a better i don't know yet well, yeah. I mean, you got to get your eyes on both of them, I think. 
right? And that's something that, again, maybe we get a better picture of it on Saturday. Who knows what they're going to give us on Saturday when we get to see a full practice? We're going to get to see, you know, some things at the Blue Gold game a week from Saturday, but we don't even know which quarterbacks are going to be out there, you know, and like if, again, I wouldn't want Riley Leonard out there, but I think you have to be able to, and this is what they used to do, you know, like when it was Ian Book, Drew Pine, or, you know, whoever, Ian Book, you know, like and, and when you, like any of these, Ian Book, Brandon Wimbush, they would have, you know, like one of the quarterbacks run five plays, and then the other quarterback would, would run the exact same five plays, and you have a head-to-head comparison for who's performing it better, you know, who's, who's, who's doing it better. We haven't, we haven't really got that yet because we're still and you know, we're going to get a five period practice tomorrow. We're still just seeing start a practice throws against air, you know, <laughs> those kind of things where, where receivers are running a few routes and all that kind of stuff. We haven't got to see what they look like in a competitive situation. And just to ease everyone's mind, because decaf came in and lit the world on fire. K.K. Bransford in the transfer portal for the Notre Dame women's basketball team. Uh, not K.K. Smith, wide receiver for the Notre Dame football team. But we'll talk about Bransford in rapid fire coming up in a little bit as well. So Denbrock also talked a little bit Saturday about what he's seen from Steve Angeli. Yeah, he's done, a, he's done a great job. He really has. And, and I think, you know, there were a couple instances today where you know, some things we talked about over the course of the last week uh, came to fruition. You know what I mean? He adjusted the protection. He got us in a good check, and we scored a touchdown. So those things, that progress from him in particular has been really, really good. And, you know, the consistency now for him in particular needs to just continue to be as good as it can be. Okay, so there's Dan Brock on and Jelly. What stands out from what you heard there? Jess, anything pop out at you? What you heard there from Mike Denbrock? Do you want to hear it again? Um, yeah, I just want the right wording because I know exactly where it's at. I just want to make sure I get the right okay. wording. Okay, here we go. One more time, Mike Denbrock on Steve Angeli. Yeah, he's done, a, he's done a great job. He really has. And, and I think, you know, there were a couple instances today where, you know, some things we talked about over the course of the last week uh, came to fruition. You know what I mean? He adjusted the protection he got us in a good check and we scored a touchdown so those things that progress from him in particular has been really really good and you know the consistency now for him in particular needs to just continue to be as good as it can be okay so what popped at you um so what popped at me first and i think this is why it stumped me he didn't directly say it but it felt like in my opinion the way that he referenced steve angeli and kind of what he's doing right now is really just a game manager. And it's a, it's a it's funny to say this because of like the, the popular debate that kind of came up towards the end of the and end of the NFL season when Cam Newton was going back and forth with these, you know, these players, whether uh, that talking about what kind of quarterback they are. It, to me, when Denbrock looks at these quarterbacks, it feels like Steve Angeli is more of a game manager, right? Like he, he can do all of the right things. He can get you to the right checks. Like they talked about, um, you know, getting the ball out, getting a touchdown, whatever. But then you enter Riley Leonard, and he seems like more of like a game changer with his ability, right? The game ability right. to to move the ball down the field, et cetera. And, and when Denbrock speaks on them, that's just kind of the tone that I get. I don't know about you. Um, and then another word that came up, obviously, was his consistency. Can Steven Jelly do things day in and day out how he's supposed to? And, again, I think that goes back to a, a playmaker, right? Like playmakers can go above and beyond above and beyond game managers have to more so worry about their consistency because they don't have that in their arsenal to be as much of a game changer their game thrives on being someone who's consistent day in and day out and doing the right things because it negates kind of you know the lack of being able to be a game changer yeah. that's kind yeah. of how i viewed that response yeah, I think that that is a uh, a good response that you had to the response. And I mean, <laughs> <laughs> cons- consistency is the word that jumped out at me. Like he needs to be like it, a very diplomatic way of saying this ain't the guy yet. You know, right. That's that's what I took from it. All the, because of all those things that you just said, he can come out there if he's asked to 
and run the offense efficiently enough. But consistency right now is the biggest thing that is holding him back. Like he can't, like, can he actually go out there and do it, play in and play out, game in and game out? And listen to Mike Dembrock, he's not there now. Now, other side of that, it is a new offense and all these different things. But again, with like when you when you watch when you watch the arm talent, you know, arm talent's become a, a very popular phrase here over the last couple of years or so. When 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 you look at that arm talent. You know, there are three guys who are at the top of the chart, and then there's Steve Angeli, basically. <laughs> it's just how it is. That's just what it is. That's just, just what it is. No, again, he can he can complete those check downs. He can, you know, efficiently enough run your offense for you, but he's not the game-changing kind of guy that Riley Leonard can be. Yeah. And really is, you know, because the, the, he's already proven that he can be a game-changer. <laughs> Is for salty wants to know is Jesse a sports talk show manager or show changer? I think when I have the board equipped with me, it's the latter, I would say. But you know, sometimes I hit I hit manager mode. Sometimes we gotta, you know, especially in the off season, it's a little bit harder. Feels like you're looking for some consistency today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe you know, the last two days have affected today. You know, this is true, honest, right? Like, is, is there any that's, I mean, you don't, you don't feel sleepy the day of because of that. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, the last two days that have gotten to you. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. So back to Riley Leonard, because of where Leonard has been these last couple of weeks, you know, he's, he's a little bit behind as you, as you heard Mike Denbrock say before, you know, just in terms of the things that he has to catch up on now. And so things are going to have to ramp up for him. This summer, so it changes our approach to the summer as a whole. As a, and, and really, even before that, and when we get done with spring football, it's going to have to be, you know, between teach tapes and voiceovers and film study and different things that we're going to have to line up for the players, even when we're not here and we're out recruiting, so that they can continue their knowledge base growing, whether that's Riley or any of the players on offense. That's going to be a huge piece. So that's going to be very well detailed out and planned out as before we even leave for May recruiting. See a busy summer ahead of him. And look, this is kind of what I've, what I've said before. It's why I wouldn't be in a rush to have him out there on the field in any capacity right now when he can, we, you know, he can watch mental reps, go to the film, do all these different things off the field and just make sure that he's a hundred percent healthy when he's had these lingering injuries basically for six months now or whatever it is six or seven months at this point because there's a lot that is going to go on this summer that's why i would not be that focused on getting him on the field in you know to any extent in the spring and just focus on what he can do in the summer to get himself ready to go for fall yeah, training camp and beyond i would honestly say that the spring the summer is going to be more important to Riley Leonard than the spring was going to be regardless of any ankle injury, because either way he was just getting the introductory course to this offense. But really what was going to be the difference maker is what was he able to absorb and accomplish basically by the end of spring before fall camp, you know, like what is he doing on his own to develop relationships with his wide receiver offensive line, running backs, et cetera. And so I think more work was going to go in on his own in the summertime, the springtime, spring camp was just a matter of, again, learning the offense, having the playbook, having the keys to the house, essentially, right? And so injury or not, I, I do agree that Riley Leonard's most, most crucial time was going to be this summer, you know, again, after the spring and, and really learning and practicing you know, what, what he needs to before fall camp officially starts. Yeah. And I, I mean, for that matter, for all the quarterbacks, really. And I mean, that's, that's just to they're going to be, they're doing summer workouts. It, they're not working out eight hours a day. They've got a few classes that they'll take and stuff like that, but there are, you know, there, there is other time where they will get out there and Riley Leonard will be out there with wide receivers. And it's like, okay, set this play up. This is what we're going to do, you know? And like, 
like you talk about getting the timing down with receivers, just knowing the plays, knowing the, the offense, all that kind of stuff. It's going to be a very important summer for Riley Leonard. And really, it's going to be an important summer for the rest of those guys as well. When you talk about the other skill position guys in the offense, because I mean, don't forget, you do have a couple of tight ends who are still banged up. They're still not out there right you know at at 100% right now so it's it's not just Riley Leonard there are a lot of different guys and they're all going to be kind of working through i think a lot of that this summer um there was a question good one from Joe we all know that Leonard is the starter but which is your backup i would just say as of right now based on what we've seen and jelly would be the number 2 again we don't have like enough to go on to say you know, Kenny Minchie is anywhere close to to catching up with Steve Angeli, I think because of the experience that Angeli has, and you know, like just in the program, not necessarily even game experience, but even though he does have a little bit more game experience, and that the Sun Bowl was valuable for Steve Angeli because he showed he could go and do it in a game. Again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, pushing all my chips to oh, Steve Angeli had this really great looking sun bowl. So now I'm going to push all my chips on that because remember what I said, if you're going to do that, then go back to the the Gator bowl two years ago and Jordan Batello. like you would have lost a lot of money if you pushed all your chips in on Jordan right. Batello because of the Gator bowl that he had. So you can't go all in on an, and jelly and the sun bowl. Again, he's proven he can be an adequate number two with a chance, you know, to, to take over that spot a year from now. But right now, you know, they went out and got Riley Leonard for a reason. So to me, Angeli is still the number two, but we haven't seen enough specifically from Kenny Minchie yet. Again, maybe we get some inklings of that in the blue gold game coming up in a week and a half. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm going to hold reservations on number two, ultimately until the blue gold game. I think it's a perfect showcase to see where all the quarterbacks are at. I get it. Not, you know, the, Technically, it's not an even playing field because you have different variables, a.k.a. different players and who they're going against, yada, yada, yada. But uh, in terms of, you know, talent, arm talent, et cetera, I'm, I'm going to see – that's going to be a big thing I'm looking for, honestly, at the Blue Gold game is who who I feel more comfortable being – you know, who I feel most comfortable with being the backup quarterback because Riley Leonard obviously has uh, a history of injuries, so you'd be very naive to not have – a backup plan and feel good about your backup plan. So yeah, that is my intention for the blue bold blue gold game. The number one thing I'm looking at. Yes. DK saying Angeli prefers one B. Nobody wants to be referred to as number two. Well, life is life. <laughs> and there's, there's always there's, a one and two. There's a one, there's a two. That's how it works, especially with quarterbacks. So <laughs> I'm sorry, you might not prefer it, but that's what you get. A uh, couple of questions about Vince is Vince's son visiting Ball State. I know he visited Ball State two did. weeks ago. Yeah, he he did that. They were talking about they might go back or something. So they might have done that while they were down there today. An old teammate of uh, Jesse's, Shaq Van, is uh, is on the Ball State staff there. Vince coached both uh, Shaq and Jesse in high school. So they you know maybe they rolled over there and talked to them at lunchtime or something like that. Who knows. David also wants to know, was the Eclipse supposed to be any better to see yes. in Muncie compared to anywhere else in the state? Yes, because if you looked at those maps that they've shown where, you know, that line of like where the, the Eclipse was going. Yeah, it was Indianapolis is the major city, but but Muncie is basically right in that band to the northeast of Indianapolis. It was like so, the southwest corner of Indiana, basically, like the, the yeah. entire south and then like southwest corner was really good. Right. To see in India. And then in so Ohio, Muncie was right in that path, basically. Yeah. And then Ohio was from like Toledo to Cleveland, had really good views. Yep. Vince had the day off. It is eclipse day. Vince has like the whole week off, if we're being honest. Yeah. Vince doing we're gonna have a talk with Vince. I hope he's listening to this right now. <laughs> Driving back. <laughs> You're on the hook, Vince. That's right. Look at the schedule this week, buddy. Oh, I'm going to take off Eclipse Day. <laughs> Apparently, his father-in-law, you know, was like, well, we're getting, I think they got like three hotel rooms down there for the oh, whole boy. crew. 
And, uh, you know, so his father, they, they packed it up and did the whole thing up. So, I mean, they were out of school. So I got you. Got nothing else to do. Yeah, exactly. Like the last That's, day of spring break. Nothing to do but do. drive through Indiana. Whoo, <laughs> man, is that fun. I tell you what, driving through Indiana, there's so much to see. Okay, one final comment from Mike Denbrock on Riley Leonard. He talked a little bit about his, uh, basically his his leadership and, you know, how, you know, what he's like in the locker room and that kind of stuff. Ben, he, I mean, the, the players love him. He, the, the locker room is 100% supporting him and everything that he's going through. Um, but I think he saw, I mean, he's, it's pretty remarkable to me that he's out here tossing it. So how important is that, Jess? I think it's important because you don't want the coaching staff to have one vision and then the players to kind of, you know, the the actual players who are playing with this guy ultimately have another vision or maybe have reservation of, ah, is this really like the our best option or the, you know, our guy type situation? Because you don't want to locker room, yeah. Yeah, you create sort of, you know, resentment of are my coaches looking after the best interests of the team or are they ultimately just trying to force in a guy because he's Riley Leonard, right? Like you, you could get someone out of the portal, like, like Riley Leonard. And just because he's Riley Leonard and every, you know, his status and how good he's supposed to be can maybe be blinding. And, and again, you're forcing or, or pushing him in there. But as long as if the players don't see it that way, and they also believe, you know, Riley Leonard's our guy. Uh, we believe he gives us the best chance. I do believe that is important because at the end of the day, the quarterback has to be one of the most, you know, vocal positions on the entire team, um, especially in the locker room. It's it's just one of your commanders essentially in the in the locker room. So I, I I think it's important and it's good to hear that that's ultimately the case. Look, they wouldn't have got Sam Hartman. Hartman, they wouldn't have brought him in last year if they didn't think he could be that kind of guy. And look at where Hartman ended up. One year guy at Notre Dame was voted a captain. I think that's very important when you look at. Haven't necessarily had a lot of quarterbacks who have ended up being captains, and and Riley Leonard essentially being talked about in the same kind of vein. So I, I agree with what you're saying. I think it's very important. You don't want any kind of split. It needs to be obvious to the rest of the team who they think the guy is, and if if they're behind Riley Leonard, then I think that that's only going to be good for everybody this year. Uh, DK had an interesting question a little bit ago. You know, they've done this uh, blue gold draft the last couple of years, and I believe they're going to do it again this year. Do you like the draft, or or would you rather see it ones versus ones out there in the blue gold game? I thought it was always one offense versus two defense, one defense versus two offense. I've well, it been... used to be, but they started doing this this player draft where they're drafting teams now. Okay. So. And so I am on board with the drafting format just because I think it brings excitement ultimately to uh, glorified scrimmage. You know what I mean? Like I just <laughs> I just think it allows for the players to be to get more into it, to for it to be more interactive at the end of the day. And um, I think it's it's that's what they've done the entirety of the spring, to be honest with you, is is everyone's in these same groupings of, you know, quote unquote, ones, twos, threes. Um, like that, I'm. I, I like it when you start mix matching stuff. See how different things work together, right? Like, see if maybe this linebacker does better with this defensive line, or you know, I don't know. I just think it adds more excitement for the players, and it gets out of just kind of the mold of this is what we've been doing the entire time. See that that that's exactly it. It definitely. I think it makes things more fun for the players because they get together. It's kind of like a you know an over glorified fantasy draft or something like that it makes it fun for them and they do it by position group and stuff like that i don't think it's necessarily good for us though as like we look at this game <laughs> and you're trying to figure out who's on who right that's like, right it's it's not good for for us and it, it it's not good you know for for fans because they're going to base too much on this because we've already guaranteed someone's going to have a great performance and if riley leonard's not out there in this game a week from Saturday and the other three quarterbacks are just like a couple of years ago when Steve Angeli made his blue gold debut when he was going up against a bunch of walk-ons and third string guys. And he led the game winning touchdown drive 
a lot of people base their opinions of Steve Angeli on that, and they haven't <laughs> given up on that opinion of Steve Angeli, largely because of that. And then you piggyback that with what we saw in the Sun Bowl, you know. So that's it's good. It's good for the old morale, I guess, and stuff like that. But you know, I don't think it does anybody else any good, really. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. But the game's not about everyone else. It's about the No, players. you're right. You're right. It's about what the what the the head coach and the team want to do. It's what they believe like I said, I've is got the no best problem. for the team and their building right. and you know the the entire thing. And so while yeah, like I would love to see ones versus ones and get a you know maybe a true grasp of where it's at. I just I did both. Like what I've done a spring ball of both. And I, I can say from personal experience. My very first year, it was the traditional format, and then my last spring ball was this format, and I enjoyed it because of that reason. It felt like the teams were more personalized, and it made it, uh, it to me, obviously, it made it more competitive as well. Yeah, I mean, look at last year, because remember, like, Sam Hartman had Jaden Thomas and Jaden Greathouse, I believe, to throw to, and Tyler Buckner, you know, didn't necessarily – you know, have the the same kind of guys to throw to. And it, it kind of made things, you know, you know again, it, it kind of skewed opinions, I think, coming out of that game. Turns out it didn't matter because Tyler Bunder, Buckner, of course, went to the transfer portal not long afterwards. <laughs> TD48 oh, yeah. wants to see a wrestling match between Denbrock and Golden. That would be interesting. Who's your money on? Ooh. Mm. I think, ah, I think Denbrock's more fiery. He is, he is a little fiery. Golden, but, but Golden's a defensive guy, yeah, so I Golden's feel like he's got to know some good tactics on takedowns. Yeah, and little little saltier, sort of little salt. They're you know they're both built pretty well. They're you know yeah. they're, Denbrock might might have a couple inches on Golden. I don't know, but if we're wrestling, <laughs> the inches don't matter. It's all a matter of who can get the other guy to the ground quicker, right? Right. Golden looks like a biter. <laughs> I like this debate we've sparked. I think Golden is a little bit younger. They're both like right in the same ballpark. They're both basically so it's a pretty you know, even early, match, early to mid fifties, basically. So yeah, it it would be very very evenly matched. So I don't. I, I would not put money on either one of those guys. Let's put it that <laughs> way. I think you got to ask at the next press conference if we can expect that at the spring game. <laughs> At the beginning to get the to set the tone. Uh huh. Salty, by the way, said that uh, with the whiteboard, you can change the show, Jesse. All right, show changer when you're when you're working. I'll the think about that. Yeah, we haven't seen any whiteboard for a while. I know. Maybe next. Well, maybe you have to week. dust it off. I think here pretty soon. Maybe after the blue gold game. There we go. We'll, we'll have a better idea. Whiteboard. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll talk about some because that'll be the first time we've actually seen whether or not they're basic or not because it's a spring game, right? Yeah, we'll still see Denbrock concepts in some capacity. Like they're they're going to be the base packages, so we'll get a good idea of you know uh, like the inside of his brain here, what he's overall thinking of the master plan. So that would be fun. I like that idea. Okay, good deal, Jesse. Are you ready for rapid fire? I am ready for some eclipse fire. Let's do it. Let's do it. Here we go. So I asked Al Golden if Kingston Villamu Asa could find himself a larger role than just special teams this season. And I just realized that I had not queued it up yet, but here is what Al Golden had to say about that. He's on track to, um, he's a, an exceptional learner. He spends a lot of time at it. Like he really, really works hard at it, and um, he's got a pros mentality. Meaning, like he comes for that to that day, he comes ready to go on the material that is being covered that day. And uh, when it comes day after day, that's what helps him stay ahead of it. And uh, so he's ultra competitive. Um, he's got size. He's got lateral quickness. Um, he's a you know, you know. He, he can blitz inside. He can play the edge if we need him to do that. So um, he's doing a great job. I mean, he's really attacked this spring, and we'll see where it goes from there. All right. So after hearing that, scale of 1 to 10, what's your confidence KVA is going to get legit linebacker reps this season? Um, There was nothing there that really was like, yes, 
he's gonna be a you know he's gonna be in the mix. Really, the thing that I felt Al Golden he said he's a on lot. track to though. He said he's yeah, on track. Yeah, that was the last of... thing that he said. And Al Golden is like, like you know, like if you look at you know, like the difference in the personalities of the two, they're both somewhat matter of fact. But obviously, you know, you heard Mike Denbrock earlier. You just heard Al Golden. Golden is a little bit more, you know, like downplay, pragmatic, you know, whereas as Denbrock, you know, kind of kind of adds a little spin to the things. I think some of them. I see what you're saying. I just feel like the when it, he kind of just the he kept highlighting on his versatility, and I think what that what I took is that is I don't think he'll be in a starter role, but I think he'll find himself in some packages that allow him to maybe not play you know traditional Mike linebacker. Maybe he's in because he he if you play the clip back again, he kept highlighting he can come off the edge, he can blitz, he can do this, he's good at that, like. I just think that that shows if they need him for a specific instance on this package of, you know, uh, this down or situation, I think he's going to find himself in those sort of roles. And so while I, I while I, I don't think he's going to get a ton of reps at like a true Mike linebacker, but I think he's going to be kind of plugged in here and there because of his versatility to do things across the board. If that makes okay. sense. You, so I'm putting it at an 8 out of 10. Talk to us. All that, you go 8 out of 10? You made it sound like you were going to give it a 4 at nope. the best. The nope. way you talked your way around. I mean, like, you literally did I just don't it. think he's going to get starting reps. I don't think he's going to get Mike Ryan back to reps. starting reps. Here, here was the question. The question that I posed and the question that I, that I said, will he find himself in a larger role than just special teams? Not a starting role. Just a larger role. Than special teams. I'm going to go ahead and play the clip again because you said if you play the clip, <laughs> he's on track to. Um, he's a, an exceptional learner. He spends a lot of time at it. Like he really, really works hard at it, and um, he's got a pros mentality. Meaning, like he comes for that to that day. He comes ready to go on the material that is being covered that day. And uh, when it comes day after day, that's what helps him stay ahead of it. And uh, so he's ultra competitive. Um, he's got size. He's got lateral quickness. Um, he's, a, you know, you know, he, he, he can blitz inside. He can play the edge if we need him to do that. So um, he's doing a great job. I mean, he's really attacked this spring, and we'll see where it goes from there. Okay, so I'm going eight as well. <laughs> I mean, you talked for like five minutes before you finally gave your eight there in the end. But you know, again, like. Pro's mentality, size, lateral, ultra competitive. First thing that he said is that, you know, basically he's trending in the direction that he is going to have a larger role than just special teams. And when you look at like the body that this guy has as a true freshman and his fit, you know, some of the physical things that we've already seen him done in, you know, limited practice windows and stuff like that. I mean, he's, I think, you know, again, I do think he's going to be on virtually every special team's you know, for Notre Dame this season. Drake Bowen is going to be the starting Mike linebacker, but I think KVA is going to be the number two. And to what you were talking about, he is going to find himself in some of those, you know, down in distance and situational packages and stuff like that. You know, whether it's blitz inside, come off the edge. I think that they can do a lot of different things with KVA. So I came away like, you know, again, I expected – sort of the standard, well, you know, he's an early enrollee and it's spring and we're only, you know, I think it's eight practices in or something like that. So I haven't really seen enough to kind of make that kind of decision yet. But he was, you know, for like, for as rosy as Al Golden is going to get, I thought he was pretty rosy in what he was saying about Kingston there. Didn't you? Yeah, I, I did. And I think I misunderstood the question a little bit. I okay. think he's definitely going to have a role – outside of you know a special teamer um but in terms i guess i was more so looking at it like is he going to take time away from drake bone i just don't think he's going to do that no and I, but saying. the thing is is too is I, everything he highlighted like you know the way he's processing how he attacks practice and and absorbs material like i that's just every linebacker especially when you're playing at notre dame like these are all guys who are doing these things at a high level so I guess there was nothing that really was like that stood out as a differentiator until he started talking about what I was defining as versatility of we can put him inside, we can put him outside. And 
again, the last, the way, the very last thing he said was if needed, right? And so, like, it feels like if we need to put him around in different packages because we feel like we are deficient here or there, or maybe on a third and long, we'd like to have a guy off the edge that brings yeah. a little bit more athleticism. Well, That's kind of what I was getting at. But he's that. also trending right now toward potentially being the number two middle linebacker right, right. off the bat behind a, you know, like another really good middle linebacker. So like that, that alone, I think says that it's looking up for KVA. I think Tommy says <laughs> celebrity death match between the Styers, the younger and Derek Calmer. Let's get it on. You ready well, for that? There's only the, the, the first of all, there's only one celebrity in that sentence. <laughs> so we have to amend the title, but I mean, we're in the same city. I'm ready at any time, any place we can. Uh, How close can to Cleveland this. is Derek? Like, is he in Cleveland? He's on the outsides. I think he's like a 20, 20. He's in the suburbs of Cleveland. Okay. My understanding is like 20 to 25. Minutes. I'm surprised you still, you haven't gotten together on that yet. He keeps inviting me, but then we'll, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> but then it, it'll be like a second before whatever, and then get mad that I don't show up. You've but. got your things to, to do, right? <laughs> Very, very important, very important <laughs> stuff going on over there in Cleveland. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame quarterback commit Deuce Knight has been invited to the Elite 11 finals after topping the leaderboard at his Elite 11 regional this weekend. I missed where the blank was supposed to be inserted. I'm sorry. I don't know. It's blank. <laughs> <laughs> it's electric. I mean, Deuce Knight. This is what happens when you send me these things like five minutes before the show starts. <laughs> no, so. no, it's it's electric that Deuce Knight um, is is continuing to be like the best of the best. Like it, he is like I love the Elite Eleven stuff because it drops to me like all the labels, right? Like it's just quarterbacks are here. It's it, let's grind, let's figure this thing out. And so that to continue to see Deuce Knight um, excel is, is like it's good and bad. It's like a double edged sword, in my opinion, because the with the more that he does, I think he's going to get more interest out of more people. Right. And like I know that he's all on Notre Dame and da 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 da. But until he is, you know, not his name is inked to the paper, you're always going to feel some type of way. And so while it's like really cool to see him you know, kill these quarterback camps and, and be one of the best of the best. It also is kind of like that pit in your stomach of, all right, let's not get like too popular here or too good here because we got a good thing going on. It's like, yeah. let's, let's stay, let's stay with Notre Dame, right? Like only Notre Dame needs to know about you, not the entire, you know, all those, all those teams down South type situations. Well, so. your buddy Lane Kiffin is all over him. I mean, Lane, you know, they, they, they want him down there. I've heard about it. He keeps showing up to his basketball games and stuff. Right. Or, or he was. Right. Tommy, I have not seen the 40 time yet. I saw him run the 40, but I haven't seen the 40 time published anywhere yet. I was looking for it in the time that I had after Jesse sent this to me um, a little while ago. But yeah, yeah I, mean, I can find it. You think he can? Yeah, let me look around a little All bit. All right. Uh, he, he was j just some of the video that I saw, of, you know, whether it was the 40 or. You know, some of the drills they had him do, he he looked pretty good and he had a man's body, you know, like <laughs> he's a he's a he's a long, lean guy. But just, you know, looking at him with the T-shirt and, you know, the physique that he's already got as a guy who's going into a senior season, he was pretty impressive looking. In it. And this was the, the yeah. Oxford, Mississippi um, regional, right? right? right. Um, I mean, just to kind of go off of this this article here from 24-7 Sports, like. They labeled him as the alpha dog. Knight's arm strength was evident as he displayed the velocity to pierce the winds at every level, despite Mother Nature's best efforts. Pierce the winds at every level. And despite Mother Nature's efforts to refute, meaning it must have been a windy day out there, um, in addition to flashing some high arm talent throughout the day, the four stars' natural ability to operate on the move as a passer is a particular attribute that should translate seamlessly into Mike Denbrock's offense. What he feels like is like to me, he's he's like uh, he's the Jaden Daniels to to Mike Denbrock, in my opinion, right? right. Like he's the profile of Jaden Daniels, Good Caleb time. Williams, all you know what I mean, all those kind of guys that are Heisman level quarterback, in my opinion. And so I just the more I, the reason why I sent that to you is just. 
you know, the more and more you see that he's doing well, it's just the more and more you get excited because I think he's going to be ultimately the best quarterback that Notre Dame has seen come through from start to finish in a really long time. I think so, too. And, I mean, he's still, you know, like to your point about the worries that he's going to go someplace else and just get more interest. I mean, he's already got a lot of interest. You still see him out there all the time, tweeting about Notre Dame, tweeting at other guys and, and stuff like that. So, obviously, it's always a concern until they sign on the dotted line. But I don't think I'm any more concerned with him than anybody else. DJ, coming in. Hot. Hit the like button. Do it. Do it now. We appreciate it. Thank you, DJ. So fill in the blank. Notre Dame women's basketball player KK Bransford entering the transfer portal is blank. It's unfortunate, right? But at the end of the day, there's always going to be a transfer. And the reason why there's always going to be a transfer is because you're playing at the University of Notre Dame. These players are the top players in the country. KK Bransford was a McDonald's All-American when she came into Notre Dame, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're one of the top players in the country, you know, you're a McDonald's All-American and you're coming into Notre Dame and you're playing, you know you have the talent to be the girl, right? Like to be the the, the lead of a team. And then when you see, you know, Hannah Hidalgo, uh, Olivia Miles, Sonia Citron, you start to kind of see your role or, you know, your spotlight dwindle down a little bit. And it's natural to want to be the head of the show, right? With so much talent, KK Bransford probably feels like I could go to another school and be the person who is leading this team, right? Like I can be the alpha of this team. And again, it sucks, but I mean, I've already seen that two UConn girls have hit the, the transfer portal. Like this happens to programs like Notre Dame, to UConn, South Carolina. When you're the top end programs, these really good players get restless. They want to play more, and they want to have more of a yeah. spotlight. She only started 19 times over the last two years. And as you said, this was the two-time Ohio Gatorade Player of the Year, Anna McDonald's High School All-American. You have higher expectations. And when you factor in everybody who's already coming back, who you touched on, you've got Hannah Hidalgo back. You've got Sonia Citron back. Good chance you get Maddie Westfeld back and then of course you're getting olivia miles back from injury next year that's four right there you know and one of them is a forward the other three are guards and then you've got kate koval coming in you've still got nat marshall and i, I wouldn't be shocked if they bring in at least two more transfers they're probably going to go out you know you got emma rish coming back i didn't even think about that you know she's she's much more of a shooter, shooter. and that's what hurts kk's game is she cannot stretch the floor. Her whole game is mid-range and in. Slash to the basket, pretty good defensive player, but she's only, you know, she hit six three-pointers this season after hitting one all of last year. So in two years, she's hit seven three-pointers, and that's just, that's not what the game is. For a guard, you know, you've got to at least be a threat from the perimeter, and you, and you would see, you know, players play off, you know, defenders play off her quite a bit, especially toward the end of the season. And you would also see her, unfortunately, sometimes kind of take probably some ill-timed shots because it gets to a point where you're always yeah. coming off the bench. And now it's like, well, you know, I got to get my shot up. Hand, I want to get my shot up. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, so it's kind of like now or never. Like if I don't get my shot up, I'm not going to get my shots up. You know what right. I mean? It's just I have a very limited window. It, you feel the pressure of, OK, I know this is my window. Let's maybe get. Not bad shots, but maybe shots that you wouldn't normally take. You know what I mean? Like, yes. like an 80 to 90% of your shot. Yep. And to, D, you know, Decaf's point was, you know, he said he was, you know, it seems like a, you know, kind of a shocking move. And he says he'd rather come off the bench and have a chance at a national championship than go start at another school. Well, unfortunately, as Jesse talked about with, with where we are with the transfer portal, that's not what most people want. Most people want to go out and they want to be they want to have their Caitlin Clark moment to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah. And you know, let's because it is also a transfer portal era, you know, transfer portal and NIL era, even though I think, you know, she's you know has good NIL opportunities here at Notre Dame, if you go to another big school someplace and you're in the starting lineup, potentially gives you even, you know, more and bigger NIL opportunities. So yep. 
all those things are intertwined. I mean, you know, very good player, but I just, you know, when, when this was announced, it was, if, if I was going to, you know, my, when, when I kind of sat there and was thinking about it over the last week, you know, who's coming back, would anyone want to go? Everyone else, you know, most people are talking about other players in terms of who might enter the transfer portal. This is the probably the least surprising to me because of all these things that we talked about. You know, she was still the like the first player off the bench, but not in the starting lineup on a regular basis. They want to be out there starting and having a chance to get theirs. I almost view the transfer portal now as just like trades. Like Notre Dame is giving KK Bransford the the or the giving the transfer portal KK Bransford and it's going to spit something out in return. Yeah. Right? It's like almost like you're just the transfer portal is like legal trading without contracts. Almost. It feels like to me. Right. Well, you know, and I didn't even mention, I don't think cast prosper potential, you know, like if she's fully healthy next year, so you're already getting miles prosper and Rish back. So that's three people right there that you're competing with time for miles is going to be, you know, like she, like the you know they, everyone talked about the big three this year. If you like West, you get Westbelt back. It's going to be the big four plus you know adding adding Koval next year. It's going to be a pretty dangerous. I mean, there's lineup. a reason why they're number three in the way too early rankings already. Right, right. And I've seen I've seen some people. I, I, I can't remember where I saw this comment today, but somebody was asking about you know does Neil Ivy you know, have enough players on scholarship. Well, you know, why doesn't she have more? You know, let's remember, she had a very, like when you look at all the players who were wearing sweatsuits at the end of the bench this year, there were, you know, like a lot more than than they had planned on. They started the season with Emma Rish and Kassan Prosper in the lineup as part of the regular rotation, not to mention Kylie Watson, obviously a fixture as a starter. So like she actually had, you know, a couple more players than she typically has this year compared to her first couple of years. It's just that they had the unfortunate run of, of all those injuries. It, you know, I keep saying it, but if they're healthy, they're going to be really good next year. Really good. Like ESPN's already got them in their way too early top three. I think they had them number three. <laughs> so more players on the bench than coaches. That's right. TD for ND. Like there were. All right, so South Carolina beat Caitlin Clark in Iowa in the Women's National Championship game. Here is South Carolina head coach Dawn Staley after the game. I really would just like to say that um, I, I have to congratulate Iowa on an incredible season. Awesome, awesome. And I, I want to personally thank Caitlin Clark for lifting up our sport. Her, she, carried a, she carried a heavy load for our sport. And it just is not going to stop here on the collegiate tour. But when she is the number one pick in the WNBA draft, she's going to she's gonna lift that league up as well. So, so Caitlin Clark, if you're out there, you are one of the goats of our games. And we appreciate you. Okay, so there, again, Don Staley, the South Carolina head coach after winning the championship. I don't know about you, Jess, but I'm just about worn out, tired of all this goat talk. And, like, everyone has to talk about goats and all that kind of stuff. Can I, I, can we just can we just put it to rest? Like, do we have to keep talking about that? Well, yeah, it's just frustrating because I don't understand why we can't just say Caitlin Clark is one of the greatest players to ever play and, and call it good at that. Like, I really liked – how Dawn Staley mentioned her. She said she is one of the goats in our game, and she always will be. I don't think you have to say that she is the greatest. Or, you know, I don't understand why it's always a competition or let's line up the track record of, you know, who is ult the ultimate goat. Like, this is a great player who influenced the game in a tremendous way. And I thought Dawn Staley said that great. And I think that that's the way everyone else needs to look at it. It's just she's a great player. She helped the game out a ton. And I hope that it continues beyond her. I hope that – she is able to, you know, motivate or inspire a generation of young girls who want to play basketball and continue to bring, you know, the spotlight to the sport. And so I just think it's rather than, hey, let's like, is she the GOAT? Let's just be thankful for what she has contributed to the women's game. 
She's one of the greatest players of all times. And all these, you know, like Brianna Stewart was was saying she's got to win a championship to be considered the GOAT. I mean, look, Brianna Stewart, like. Those girls played on the best teams ever. Right. Like, and, they, they and that's. that's they like, were There were four Clay, Caitlin Clarks on one team. And that's what I was going to say. Like, to hear these UConn players take shots at Caitlin Clark is just ridiculous. Because, because of what you said, like. UConn and, you know, like go back to the Pat Summit, Tennessee years. It's like every player was a Diana Taurasi or a Sue Bird or Brianna Stewart or a Maya Moore or, uh, you know, Candace Parker on and on and on. You know, they, the, 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 the talent was just you know, the, the rosters were loaded with this five star talent. And essentially, you know. Like Vince was talking last week about, well, those Iowa players, they're, you know, they're really good. They're, they're nice role players. You know, like Stokey, I think, has the, you know, the biggest upside of any of them. They're good players. They know their system. They know their roles on that team. But Caitlin Clark completely elevated that team. With no Caitlin Clark, Iowa's not in the national championship. Oh, not one bit. Two years in a row. They're not even close to it. They're, they, you know, they might not even, they might be, you know, like a first or second round NCAA tournament team, but they're not what they were without Caitlin Clark. So it's just completely different. It's an apples to oranges argument when these UConn players start, you know, setting the standard with winning championships because that's all they're used to. I mean, they've got more championships than anybody. Those teams could go out and and probably win gold medals for the U.S. in the Olympics. Right. Like, to be honest with you, those UConn women teams – that you know had star after like they could have went and, and won gold medals like it's just not it's just not a fair comparison and then you brought up another good point it's just like I, these UConn players consistently bashing on someone like Caitlin Clark was just not a good scene in my opinion well, it's just you know the fact that you've already got Rebecca Lobo sitting you know in that chair on you know on the main ABC broadcast for the final four and I think she does a good enough job, but everybody knows she's Rebecca Lobo, you know, from, from the Yukon Huskies. So you've already got someone from Yukon sitting in the big chair on the TV broadcast. Then you have the bird Tarasi, right? It's just too much Yukon there, you know, like, right. Th- th- you need somebody else from another school. There are plenty of Tennessee players, whether it's, you know, like Andrea Carter does a great job in the studio and I wouldn't want to see her leave the studio, but like, that's someone who could easily, you know, be in one of those seats. Like if you're going to do the Bird Tarasi show, I think there needs to be a player from another program that's that's in there with them to just not let, you know, to to kind of some checks and balances, you know, to keep them, you know, sort of to, to, to check them a little bit. Just like you've got, you know, Barkley, Kenny the Jet Smith. And, and, and Shaq on inside the NBA, you need somebody from a different program to kind of yeah. I mean, and you got different the you know that's those point guard, a power forward, and a center, right? So yeah. it's just like different teams, different positions, different perspectives. But I just ultimately don't understand like what what gives them not the right, but like those UConn players bashing her and saying that she needs to accomplish this or that or this or that. Like it just felt it didn't feel right, and you know I get it, like. Every rookie or freshman, quote unquote, is always going to catch a hard time from the vets. Like that's no matter if you're going into high school, college or professionals, like no one likes the rookie. No one likes the the freshman. You know what I mean? Like they're the grunt. They get picked on whatever. But like I don't understand the hate for someone who has the potential to bring excitement to the WNBA like they did college basketball. Like you should want a player like this in your league because of the potential right. exposure that she can bring to you. Because you know what that means? more fans, more t- sales and tickets, more TV, uh, more eyeballs on the TV. And that just means more money in the bigger contracts for those women players that already feel that they're at a disadvantage when compared to the WNBA or sorry, the NBA. And so again, why would you not be rooting for someone like Caitlin Clark to join your league when ultimately she can generate more revenue? That's just my opinion on the situation. Cause it's ultimately and, more jealousy, you know, like right, Diana and Taurasi got to be one of the biggest stars in the game. And it's like, she's been playing professionally for 20 years now. Like, you know, you're going to retire at some point. Can't you just be grateful that someone is going to, as you just said, bring more attention to your sport rather than crap all over them because you're jealous of them, basically of the attention that they're getting, you know, like you got to win your championships. 
Yeah, and no one time. did that to them along the way either. You know what yeah. I mean? Like no one was like sitting there questioning them about their talent or their project, how they'll project into professionals or that they need to accomplish this or that to validate how good of a player they are. It just simply wasn't like that. Absolutely. So the women's championship game just uh, came out this afternoon, right before the show started. 18.7 million viewers. So each of Caitlin Clark's last three games, Elite Eight, Final Four, National Championship, set a new viewership record. 18.7. Coming into this year, you know, coming into the Elite Eight a week ago, I think, what was it, like 10.7 was the record from last year's championship mm -hmm. game so the the viewership nearly doubled from last year's championship game to this do you buy or sell tonight's men's game getting to that number 18.7 million yeah so women peaked at 18.7 million and, and it said that they had 24 million uh or sorry average 18.7 and peaked at 24 million at one point i don't know if the men are going to beat that because the thing about caitlin clark is she is getting casual fans to watch the game right and i don't think the men have anything to to do that like they're not just getting people to to click over because like everyone knows the Clay, caitlin clark name and so whether or not you're a basketball fan a women's basketball fan like you could be a casual you know uh i would say maybe female and, and you want to feel empowered or, or kind of feel this movement so you're just going to tune in because you've heard about this caitlin clark i don't think the men have anyone in that they, they have good you know the, the returning national championship at UConn. You mean guess, Zach Eady doesn't push the needle like <laughs> yeah. Caitlin Clark? Yeah, the 7'4 giant doesn't quite push the, <laughs> the needle for me. And so I honestly don't think they're going to because I think unless you're like a fan of, of men's college basketball or of these two programs, you're not just getting the stray viewer. That's ultimately what I was trying to say is like Caitlin Clark got a bunch of stray viewers because she's Caitlin Clark. I don't think the men's game has something like that right now. I agree. I don't think the men's, I, I think, I think maybe they come close, you know, like in the 17, 18 million ballpark, it is going to be on TBS compared to broadcast. You know, the women's game was on ABC, you know, and that's a big part of this contract as well. The fact that, that they're all, you know, the men's is alternating back and forth every year between uh, TBS and CBS. The, the, the Kansas Carolina championship game a couple of years ago got a, a nice number, but those are two of the bluest blood programs that you could have. Like that's a dream matchup for any TV network to have Kansas against North Carolina in the national championship game. That's not UConn Purdue. It just doesn't move the needle the same way. So decaf gets it. No interest in the men's game tonight. I'll be watching the Cubs is what decaf said. And it's, I'm going to be honest. It's going to be tough because we're going to talk about these tip off. Times. <laughs> now look, the women's game is tipped off at three in the afternoon, two years in a row. There was some grumbling about that. The men's game tonight is going to tip off tonight at 920. And there's obviously grumbling about that as well. Like, what do you think about these times? I'm I've glad no you problem with the women's game tipping off. I'm glad you've combined this into one question. I love the women's tip yesterday. It was I, I had I had enough to get up. I had enough to go walk around. We got to downtown. We went to the Science Center, had a couple of drinks, went to a bar and caught the end of the game in downtown Cleveland. Like it was great, right? Like it felt like I could get everything else I wanted done in my day and the national championship fit into that schedule. Yeah. And I could just continue to keep going, right? And the, the late game sucks. I don't want to stay up that late for it. And if you had to pick between the two, I would take the women's start over the men's start. And again, that's why I'm glad Absolutely. you combined the question. I would much rather have the women's start than the men's start. There is I just – I don't know if, if, if it being in Arizona has something to do with it because it's not a 6-20 tip until local time. They always but... tip off the men's championship at 9-20. It's ridiculous. It doesn't matter where they play it. It's ridiculous. And they feel like it's that popular of an event. I, 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 like it is, at the, but it's not, it's, not, it's not at the same time. <laughs> right. And, I mean, the fact that – the women's game in the middle of the afternoon pulled that kind of number just shows you that people will watch if you put it on a time where everyone can watch. And people always talk about, oh, the kids, the kids. The kids were able to watch Caitlin Clark. They're going to be in bed tonight when, you know, this game tips off. 
Most of them are going to be in bed or head. And they're returning back to school after spring break. This that's right. This eclipse day. Or, like, or, you know, driving Everyone's back crashing and burning. You know, after, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, I, I've got, because like, basically like the women's, pe- the, the, the women's fans complaining about the three o'clock tip off. They're saying, oh, we're not good enough for prime time. That kind of thing. Well, they just proved you don't need to put it in prime time yeah. on a Sunday afternoon when everybody's off work. I mean, that's that's why so many weeknight games get pushed to prime time because people are at work. The NFL plays at one o'clock and four thirty every Sunday, and people watch that like it's always you know it's the most viewed you know, TV programming year in and year out. Like they've got no problem with it. I've got no problem with it. I thought it was perfect, and you're also not going like Sunday night prime time is also one of the bigger, you know, there's not as much probably on right now, but it, it is still, from a TV standpoint, that's still where you put some of your best programming is Sunday night. And so you don't have to worry about going up against any of that either if you put it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the fact that a record 18.7 million people, you know, 24 million with an average of 18.7 just proves the point. 920 is ridiculous. Like, I didn't think that I was going to be able to make it you know, remember last week when uh, I guess it was it was Friday night. I didn't think I was going to be able to to stay up for Iowa UConn for the women's final four. You know, in the second semifinal, I'm not nearly as interested in Purdue and UConn as I was in Iowa UConn on the women's side Friday, though. Especially at halftime, if it's not close, you're going to get a lot of people who click away. Yeah. Salty asking what happened to Kansas. Now, are we talking about when they played in the championship game that I just referenced, you know, the championship game that they won two years ago against North Carolina, or are we talking about this season? Basically, a couple of their, their best, best player players was hurt this yeah. year. Yeah, that's right. And not only was it their best player, it was a guy who was like Naismith. Like, you know, like he had he been healthy, he would have been a Naismith yeah. finalist. Lance McCuller Jr. That's right. So. I mean, it happens. Like no excuse for the Notre Dame women's, though. Am I right? For what? The injuries. <laughs> what are you talking about? What they continued on. Oh, that's true. That's true. They found a way. All right, Jess. Fill in the blank. John Calipari leaving Kentucky after 15 years in Lexington to take over at Arkansas is blank. It's shocking, honestly. I never thought Calipari would leave Kentucky. For another SEC school. Um, and it's shocking. It, again, like I always throw the term out like lateral, right? And I don't know what the next move is in terms like can he go any higher? It felt like Kentucky for what he like what he wants to do, it felt like Kentucky was always going to be home for him, right? And like when you talk about getting some of the best players, them going on to the NBA, helping them in their career, you know, preparing them for the NBA. Etc. It felt like Kentucky was always going to be the best place to do that, and so to go to another SEC school is really shocking. And it, it, like I remember going back to like 2014, LeBron when LeBron was going to come back to Cleveland for the second time, and the Cavs had the number one overall draft pick. They threw a ton of money at John Calipari to become to to ask them to become their next head coach. Yep. He turned it down, and so clearly he wants to stay in college. And so how much of a pay? upgrade is he getting i don't know but did you see the video of him today walking his dog in the stroller pushing you know what that you know what that gave what vibes that gave to me i think you'll appreciate this that gave me um george bluth vibes off arrested development (laughs) i love it doesn't it though like he's like like walking around knowing he's kind of a wanted man being like oh Uh You're coming up to me asking oh, me, oh, me? You're talking to me as I'm walking my dog in a stroller on like a very public, you know, road. Like it felt very, right. I don't know. I just, as soon as it, I saw that, I was like, this feels like George Bluth off the rest of <laughs> <laughs> when he's like in hiding or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's it ultimately to answer your question, it's shocking. And yeah, I was shocked too, but there's a different level of expectation, obviously. Now, you know, 15 years at Kentucky is a long time and he had a lot of success but you know there was already talk when he when they lost to Oakland you know that wow this this could be it for Calipari I didn't really think it would come to that but money talks I guess because 
between Jerry Jones and I was going to say, do you, you hear know, the Jerry Walmart Jones family is funding, and the Tyson funding Chicken this? family? Yeah, they're like they're throwing all kinds of money together for him down there, and it sounds like Calipari is going to kind of shift his philosophy as well because he had stuck you know pretty hard to that to the one and done guns, and I think that that's why he didn't have more consistent success here down the stretch. Like he's gonna he's gonna go to the portal more. And you know those those kind of things. And so you're telling me it's going to be more of team basketball, theoretically. Because honestly, and I don't think this is a bad thing. John Calipari prided himself off of helping those one and done guys be first the NBA. Drafted. Like he, yeah. that was part of the gig to him. Like right, he he compensated not winning national champ. I mean, at least he says so, right? Like everyone's not going to be like, oh, you know, I don't care about winning national champion, but like. Part of the process to him or what made the job gratifying or fulfilling to him is knowing that he would get some of the top talent in the world and maturing these men as much as possible to go on to the NBA and be as successful as possible. Like that was a part of his role. And so for him to step away from that and be more team basketball, and like you said, maybe two to four year guys and transfer portal guys, I think we might see like Memphis John Calipari come back, you know, when he had Derrick Rose there. It's exciting. I think it's exciting for college basketball. Yeah. I mean, Arkansas is going to be a player again, like they were. I, I know you're way too young to remember Nolan Richardson and 40 minutes of hell and all that kind of stuff. But those were fun days. I mean, it, it felt like Arkansas was good at football and basketball, like right before I was around, like the 80s and 90s. <laughs> That's true. Just like the Cowboys were right. good at something before you were around. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly Right. But, you know, again, different era, different era, you know, back then, the last time Arkansas was, was really good when guys stuck around for four years, Corliss Williamson and Scotty Thurman and and those kind of guys. But uh, it'll be, it'll be, uh, it'll be fun to kind of see what, what Calipari can bring to that. It's an evolution. How much is he, how much is he willing or going to change at the end of the day? Yeah. Back in the day. That's right. UNLV was, was relevant. UCLA was a power Duke, all those different programs. Tommy, uh, <laughs> Tommy says we haven't seen Jesse's props, prop bets. I've been doing good with baseball so far. I'm waiting for the season to kind of progress a little bit. I, you know, like it's hard with baseball when you have 162 games. You can't really figure out trends in the first week. True, but it's fine. Right. We'll be looking forward to that then. All right, Jess. Appreciate you coming in today. Get some sleep tonight. Sleep it off. Yeah, one more thing. Nope. That's it? I was just telling myself I'm number one because I oh, showed okay. up today and Vince didn't. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you're number one. You're the uh, you're the favorite co-host today. Vince, Thank you. Vince falls to number four, I think, by the time the week is over, right? All right, well, that's going to do it. Hit that like button before you leave. And, of course, subscribe, rate, review, listen to your podcasts as well we appreciate you and we will talk to you Uh uh-oh tommy's calling you out for no showing on friday i didn't no show i let the people know i had obligations vince is scheduled that this vince is is anticipated to be here on friday he is expected to be here on friday vince put together this spreadsheet that everyone plugs in days on and off and all that kind of stuff and I think Vince has taken advantage of the spreadsheet. (laughs) We'll talk to you tomorrow on Ivy Nation Sports Talk.